This lesson deals with the critically damped natural response of a series RLC circuit. You can find these notes in the ECE201 ebook in chapter 7 starting on page 41. What we looked in the previous lessons was the natural response of a series RLC circuit. What we're going to look at in this case is what's called the critically damped case. This is where alpha is equal to omega naught. We go back to our formulas on page 35 of chapter 7. We have a radical that has alpha squared minus omega naught squared, and that term drops out now. So S1 and S2 are just equal to minus alpha. And that was equal to R thevenin over twice the inductance. So we go back to our form of our solution of this second order differential equation. We had that the current flowing in the series elements was A1 e to the S1t plus A2 e to the S2t. But since S1 equals S2 now equals minus alpha, we could factor out the A1 plus A2. But that's really just the sum of two constants, which is just another constant. Now the problem here is we have two independent initial conditions to satisfy, and we only have one unknown here. This can't possibly be the solution for this particular case. So again, we have to go back and take guesses and try to find a solution. Then we plug it back into our original differential second order equation. Then we get uh, the zero on the left-hand side equals a zero on the right-hand side. But we start with our basic form that we had here and maybe begin to add something to one of these two terms. Probably the simplest thing to try is just t. Let's try that and see if it works. What we have to do is differentiate this twice and then multiply by the appropriate constants. Now what we've got here is a product of two things that are a function of time. And back in chapter three, we talked about taking the derivative of a product of two terms with respect to, say, this case t, using the product rule. And the product rule is that you take the derivative of the first term times the second, plus the first term times the derivative of the second. So let's apply that here. The derivative of this term is just going to be a1 and multiplied by e to the minus alpha t. And then take the derivative of this, which is going to be equal to minus alpha e to the minus alpha t, and then multiply that by a1 times t. And that's this term right over here. And then we just have one function of time here. So the derivative of this is minus alpha e to the minus alpha t, and again times a2. Okay, now let's group the terms that multiply a1 e to the minus alpha t and a2 e to the minus alpha t. So I've got this term here once, and then I've got that term again with a1. I'm multiplying by minus alpha times t, and then I've just got this term brought down over here. So that's my first derivative of i with respect to t. The second derivative would again be doing our product rule here. I've got this term here times this term. And so the derivative of this is just minus alpha times a1 e to the minus alpha t. And then I'm going to take the derivative of this, which is going to be a1 minus alpha e to the minus alpha t, and multiply that by 1 minus alpha t. And then the derivative here of e to the minus alpha t is going to be minus alpha e to the minus alpha t. So I'm going to get minus alpha twice here. I'll get that squared with a plus sign. And then a2 e to the minus alpha t. Let's just multiply all this out then. So I've got this first term here, and then I've got this term times minus alpha times this, but that's the same as this term here, so I've got two of those. And then I've got a plus alpha squared times t times a1 e to the minus alpha t, and then I've got this term over here. Does this guess solution satisfy our differential equation that we found for the series RLC circuit? Where's this side of the equation equals zero? Remember that alpha is equal to R thevenin over 2L, but now alpha squared is equal to omega naught squared, and that was equal to 1 over LC. We could rewrite this term over here now because of our equality of alpha and omega naught as just alpha squared here. And we could write uh, this term over here as just alpha times 2. So let's graph them up on top. Here was the second derivative term that we had. Here was the first derivative term. We'll multiply that by 2 alpha. And then here's the solution that we were guessing at times alpha squared. Does all this equal 0? Well, let's multiply it out and group terms together here. So my first term is right here. It's going to copy this down right over here. I'm going to multiply this through by 2 alpha. So I've got 2 alpha times 1 times a1 e to the minus alpha t. That's this term right here. And then I've got this term times this. So I'm going to get a minus 2 alpha squared times t a1 e to the minus alpha t. And then I'm going to multiply this times this and get a minus 2 alpha squared a2 e to the minus alpha t. And then likewise, let's multiply out this term here with alpha squared. And so I've got the first term here, which is a1 uh, times t e to the minus alpha t times alpha squared. And then I've got this term here with a2 e to the minus alpha t times alpha squared. And I kind of grouped these things together so I could show you the subtraction right here. 
This term is the same as this. There's two positive terms and then two negative terms. And then I've got two negative terms and two positive terms. They all cancel out. So zero equals zero. So that guess did work. And normally not that lucky on the first shot, but it does satisfy our differential equation with the fact that alpha equals omega naught. Now let's go back to our using our initial conditions. Now we know that the current in an inductance cannot jump instantaneously. If it does, then you have to produce infinite voltage because V is equal to L di dt. Let's plug in that T is equal to zero plus or minus, just around zero. And so this is going to make the exponential equal to e to the zero, which is equal to one. But with T being equal to zero, that knocks this term out and all we have is A2 and the value of the inductor current at zero plus is the same as zero minus. We also have the derivative of I with respect to T. And of course that's equal to E sub L over L and that's at T equals zero plus. We're going to use the initial conditions at zero minus to figure out what that voltage is equal to, just like we did in the overdamped case. So let's take our first derivative here and bring it here back down from up on top and it's at T equal to zero. I'm going to make this term equal to just e to the zero, which is one, so it's a one. The t equal to zero drops this term out. This is gone. And then we have this last term, which is minus alpha a two, and then e to the zero, which is equal to one. So now we've got some different conditions here for i one and the derivative of i one is zero plus. Let's do an example. We're going to change just the resistor here, our thevenin from the previous value of 4.7k to 1k. It's the same initial conditions, and we can kind of compare our answers then. Value of alpha and omega naught, calculate again. Now it's R thevenin of 1k over twice the 50 millihenries. Now that's equal to 10,000 radians per second, and our omega naught's still the same value as was previously. It's 10,000 radians per second. So again, alpha is equal to omega naught. The derivative of i with respect to t at 0 plus, and of course that was shown previously as v sub l over l at 0 plus. And then we'd found back on page 38 that this was the value of the voltage across the inductance at a 0 plus in terms of the initial current and the initial voltage across the capacitor. Different value for R7 here, but we're multiplying it by zero. So we're going to get the same value we had previously of minus 240 amps per second. We'll go back to our initial condition equation back on page 43. And because I of zero plus is equal to I of zero minus, and then this example is equal to zero, that makes A2 equal to zero. And then our derivative was equal to A1 minus alpha A2 back on page 43. But A2 is equal to zero, so that's going to drop this term out. We just have that A1 is minus 240. Then our Solution in this particular case is going to be A1 T e to the minus alpha T plus A2 e to the minus alpha T, but A2 being zero, we just have this term here, and A1 is equal to minus 240. So this is the value of our current for T greater than zero. We'd shown that it was equal to zero prior to the switch changing state. Of course, the current cannot jump instantaneously, and if you evaluate this equation at T equals zero, you'll get zero. And so we have continuity at, at T equals zero. It's always true for an inductor current or capacitor voltage. Two things here that are changing with time. We have minus 240T multiplied by this decaying exponential. So when we first start to look at time elapsing, this term won't be changing very much until we get to five time constants. So this is going to be dominating the expression. As time goes on, this gets bigger, but this is going up as a power. So it's going to overwhelm this term and essentially bring the answer back to zero. Let's take a look at the simulation of this. Grab the previous file that we had. So the same initial conditions. All I'm changing here is the value of R7 and making it 1000 ohms. So I'll run the same simulation and the same uh, print step and final value and ceiling step. You can see that this curve has kind of changed dramatically what it was before. It took longer for this to decay back to zero, but we've got this response right here. And that's because of that combination of terms that we have. So let's again, let's zoom on this and see what's happening in the first millisecond of this response. I've done 2000 data points. So if I zoom on this, I'll have quite a few data points. So we get what appears to be a very smooth picture. So here we are as T is starting to uh, change. This term looks here, very straight line. That's really our minus 240 T. That would be a, a straight line with a slope of minus 240. So you're seeing that right here. So as time goes on, we see that this term here it's going to be very, very small multiplying by this, even though this is increasing. And it's actually pulling the value back to zero. This is going to happen because we have no independent source. We're going to dissipate that energy that was stored in it's just the capacitance. This is the shape of a critically damped natural response of an RLC circuit.